Welcome um, to Alina, to all of you, and um, I'm very happy to be here. And um, I would first like to say that uh, me personally, I find me some also like a not only like a moderator, also like a participant, because I made this project on Sophie Scholl and we got, I think, a huge success with 900,000 people who, who were daily on that on that Instagram channel and followed the daily life of that historical character of Fischol. And also we got some, some critical claims by, by press reviews saying that this is a kind of a, of a provocative thing we are doing because we are not, it's not a serious scientific approach we follow, but like a, like a, like a, like a colloquial everyday approach. Um, and I think for me it was interesting that mostly of this 900,000 people were young participants so followers like like nine like 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 uh, 19 to 29 and i think like three quarters of this nine hundred like six hundred fifty thousand were really young people who followed us that was quite surprising and um, what i found out is that um, for me someone who is more in the traditional league of scientific uh, reading books and everything, this could be a, something which is really new. And I found out it's not new, it's already there. This kind of digital, um, um, this kind of digital resources you use just in order to get to young people. So, <clears throat> um, I think every one of you here has got some experience with this subject. And so, first of all, first I would like to speak to Vyayan. Could you please tell us and give us a little information on how you came across this subject of digi digital remembrance? Uh, <clears throat> do I have my presentation and we're doing the presentations first, or? Uh, okay, thank you uh, for the introduction. Thanks uh, for all of you to uh, be here. I think it's been a very interesting conference so far, and especially this morning's uh, keynote speech also talking about uh, um, textbooks. And uh, I've been on several projects also analyzing textbooks, but I think uh, our panel today is going to be moving the next step, uh, bringing in the digital aspect. So, I mean, I've been a... Um, uh, professor at the University of Rijeka now for over 15 years. I guess I would say I started more traditionally, but uh, more recently also uh, teaching digital humanities classes. And my main focus has been sites of memory, so I guess it could be on the panel or the session too as well. <clears throat> but I've been looking at uh, sites of memory and uh, other kinds of commemorative practices in the former Yugoslavia, mostly focusing on Croatia. And I think in these last 15 years we have seen a shift from, let's say, the analog of looking at monuments, destroyed monuments, rebuilding monuments, which happened throughout uh, the former Yugoslavia and the erasing of memory. And now we have these new digital tools and teaching, using them also f not just for society more broadly, but also for young people. And I think it's, it's very exciting to be here on this uh, panel uh, with uh, the colleagues who will be discussing this. So I have a few uh, images of some projects that I've worked on. And this first one is uh, a new art installation, but it's about a monument that was destroyed in the 1990s. Uh, and now it's impossible to rebuild. It was by a famous Croatian uh, artist and architect, Vojn Bakic. It was destroyed in 92 by the Croatian army, and it was just a, a vast field. And we use these digital technologies to kind of to revive it because rebuilding it is just simply not possible in uh, this uh, this time. And what is what are young people's interactions with the past in Croatia? Uh, here's an example of a bunch of young people working on a mural, a war-themed mural, and that's actually the focus of my more, most recent work is uh, this muralization of the past, muralization of war. And we see uh, that these murals and graffiti by young people aren't necessarily being used in a subversive way, which maybe art and street art and graffiti has been used generally, but they're replicating the dominant narratives, the wartime narratives. And these are young people, these aren't veterans doing these murals and graffitis, these are young people that are in a way celebrating uh, the militarization, or as we heard earlier today, the weaponization of the past, which I see as a very problematic um, kind of movement. So uh, 
what are these various uh, digital tools? I'm also involved in a number of mapping projects. That seems to be quite popular. One of these is called Contested Histories. It's also funded by uh, Euroclio. They have a whole uh, packet of educational tools. But what they're working on now is this uh, huge digital map with lots of sites. And it's not just, as we heard earlier today, uh, totalitarianism or communism and fascism but it also explores racism, colonialism, many, many different legacies, and it's a global project. So I think that's uh, quite interesting. Here's just a map, and you can see that the sites are you know, global. Uh, also for, uh, for Europe, there's many different uh, uh, sites, and there's case studies for each of them. So that's, let's say that's the, the, the broader international cooperation kind of project, but I have a number of similar projects at the University of Rijeka, which is in Croatia. It's in also a, a borderland. Uh, it had uh, you know, also a very contested history from Austro-Hungarian Empire to then um, Italian occupation, and we had, there was a, a, a warrior poet there, Gabriel D'Annunzio, for a while, and then there was uh, fascism, and then uh, communism and the socialist Yugoslavia and now independent Croatia and one of these projects I have in, including students is to have them also collect these images and post them on uh, this map that we're working on so I mean there's a number of other also more professional projects but I think this gives students a chance to get involved we're talking about the digital here but it's also other media and I think it's important for also students to go to these sites and I'm here uh, with two fellow um, scholars who work on these sites. So yes, we have the digital platforms and it reaches out, but at the end of the day, to bring students to these sites of memory, here are two close to Rijeka. One is uh, called Tito's Gulag on the island Goliotok, and another one is uh, a village that was burned by uh, the Wehrmacht and Italian uh, fascists in 44. So bringing students to those places and then combining what we can call dark tourism or war tourism or maybe nicer remembrance tourism. Uh, and because Rijeka has these layers, these palimpsests, these forgotten sites and all these different empires and regimes and dictatorships that were in power, we've created through a project called Rijeka Fiume in Flux. And it's an app on your phone and you can go to see sites of memory that are there or sites of memory that aren't there using also augmented reality so you can like pull up old images. So I think this is a, uh, one aspect, and, and now here, how to recover these erased memories, and I know we have to be brief here, so I have just a few more slides, not to take up too much time, but this is this monument that I showed in my first image, and it's a history of the amazing architecture. I mean, maybe you've heard or followed these images of uh, socialist monuments in the former Yugoslavia, Spomeniks, uh, really quite some amazing uh, examples. This is one of the most famous ones, or it's, and you just, as you can see, it's abstract. There isn't an explicit communist or socialist message in there, yet even this was destroyed, uh, in this case because of its valuable metal. So it was just like a plain uh, field, and to recover that memory and to bring the community together. So uh, the, the mayor of one of these villages was crying because he hadn't seen so many people on the site uh, since the 1990s when this monument was destroyed. So there are ways to move beyond the classical monument form. Um, and here's a positive example of murals. This is a, an anti-fascist uh, woman who was killed by the Italians uh, in the 1940s, I think 42, and now using this mural as a place for commemoration because in the 1990s, a lot of this memory was erased in Croatia and young people don't know about it. It's been replaced by that, the war of the 1990s, but they forget about... Uh, anti-fascism, solidarity, and uh, other events from the Second World War because they've been erased from the um, public space. And uh, we heard yesterday from Dan Wolf, and he's now in Yasenovac working with young people on this uh, new uh, ENRS project. Here's what Yasenovac looks like. I don't know if anyone has a chance to be there, but it's actually, there's very few remains of the original camp. So how do you convey what happened there at an authentic site of memory when there's nothing left. And the Yugoslav socialist regime made this uh, monument there, you can see in the back, uh, called the flower or stone flower, and they made some landscape memorial architecture. But to really recreate what was there, we used digital technology, and this is a new installation, a 3D map of 
the camp so you can see what buildings were there. Uh, and to take it to even one more step, uh, you maybe can tell I have an American accent. I grew up in the U.S. And there's recently a new initiative in the U.S. called Beyond Granite. And it's about building artistic interventions of marginalized groups and forgotten memories on the National Mall. Maybe if you've been to the National Mall, I mean, it's very monumental. But to build a monument there takes many years of lobbying, about $37 million average for a monument, and then 10 years after it's been approved to actually build it. So many groups just don't have lobbying power to get on the mall, but this initiative has it. So we've got uh, indigenous peoples, um, uh, African Americans, and, and so on. Another example, near the Vietnam War Memorial, a um, intervention about all the civilians that had to leave Southeast Asia. So I'll just end there uh, with that. So these are some of the projects that I've been working on, but also connected to a much broader discussion about the use of digital tools. Thank you, Vian. Thank you, Vian. Um, and then we have um, Malena on my left. Um, she's um, working uh, for the Mauthausen Me Memorial. And you are like, may I say that, like a TikTok expert. Yes. Um, for commemorative culture. Um, I would like to introduce you to the TikTok account of Mauthausen Memorial and later we can also speak more about commemorative culture connected to um, the Shoah and Holocaust um, on a broader sense. Um, I don't know how much everyone knows about Mauthausen concentration camps, so I'm just going to mention some data and facts to get a rough idea and then going to tell you and introduce you to, the, to our TikTok work. Um, Mauthausen concentration camp was founded in 1938 when Austria and Germany merged together and was liberated in May of 45, and it was the last camp to be liberated by the US Army. Um, overall, we're talking about um, a victim count of about 200,000 people being deported there and 100,000 people being murdered there. It is the concentration camp memorial in Austria, so it has quite an important status in Austrian commemorative culture, and a lot of students visit the site. But there's also a whole bunch of tourists and international visitors and relatives of victims coming each year. Um, the memorial is one of the oldest concentration camp memorials in Europe because it's now 75 years old, so it has existed for quite a while. My work there is in the educational department. I do tours and workshops with students, and I've been doing this for about eight years. And all this knowledge and those skills have gone into um, our TikTok account. Our TikTok account is a combination between the PR department and the educational department, whereas other social media platforms are more influenced by the PR department uh, and are in a more classical style of social media, of giving information. For years, it was a taboo for concentration camp memorials to be on social media. And if they were there, they mostly had a function of being an ascending um, institution, not really being in, in communication, but just sending information out. And what we tried to do with our TikTok account is to change that a bit and to become more dialogue-based. This is also the way that the educational concept of Mauthausen Memorial works, to be in dialogue with visitors, that includes in tours and workshops. Um, yesterday and today we've heard about the multi-perspectivity already. This is also a principle that has been implemented at the memorial for over a decade, um, as well as the idea of connecting a space, a historical space, the authentic site with us right now, me, the visitor who is there, and then with history. So space, um, the place, the history, and the person. Um, and that influences what we do on social media. Um, we try to address a younger audience on TikTok, um, but there's also a whole lot of people in the 50s following our account, so TikTok really isn't just for the young generation. Um, it really depends on what we cover in a video and what the topic is. TikTok is the only account where we actually have a direct line to students who also visit the memorial. In all other forms, this goes via teachers, via um, news outlets, but there we are in direct contact with, um, with students ages from 13 to 20. 
Um, I've brought a couple of examples with me from our TikTok account. Um, I've got four short videos. Um, and I'd like to start with... Some visitors of the memorial seem disappointed when I tell them that in Mauthausen concentration camp there never was a sign saying Arbeit macht frei. Those signs existed in Dachau and in Auschwitz, main camp, but not so in Mauthausen. Now I know when I click the button it plays. Um, so this is dealing with the myth and expectations of a visit, but also with historical facts. This is one of the layers that we try to tackle and one of the topics in general that we have. Um, but it's not just about biographies or the space and the history and facts. Um, it's also about um, people coming to the memorial site and this is another example of that. You can't pay attention when you're so cold that your limbs go numb and you're shaking. When you visit a concentration camp memorial in winter or early spring, Please check the weather forecast and bring layers. Mauthausen Memorial is at the top of a hill and most days it's super windy there and except for the exhibition, all the interesting stuff you're going to look at is outside. So please dress appropriately. I've done enough tours in winter to know. You can't pay attention when you're so cold that you're shaking and your limbs go numb. This loops and goes around and around as TikTok just shows the video again and again. Um, I'm just going to go on to the next video that uses a style that is well known in history teaching to explore biographies and this uses a biography that we are um, using in a, in a workshop and the materials and the pictures are taken from there. Have you ever heard of a black person growing up close to a Nazi concentration camp? Today I want to tell you the story of Ahmed Kranzmeier who lived in the town of Mauthausen. He was raised by his grandma. His mom lived in Vienna and he never knew who his father was. Even though he was the only black kid in school, Ahmed was well accepted and popular before the Nazis took power. He spent a lot of his time out and about playing with friends. From 1938 onwards, Ahmed was deemed undesirable by the Nazis, but he could still play with kids his age. A friend even invited him to go up to the concentration camp one day, but his grandma felt uneasy about it and intervened. Ahmed often saw inmates of the camp work near the Danube. The boy was keen to be part of the local community. His life became more difficult and sad because he was eager to be part of things like the Nazi youth organization, but he was not allowed to join. He became completely isolated. When Ahmed was nine, he was sent to Vienna, where he was forced to undergo an examination. In Nazi ideology, Ahmed was seen as an alien to the race, and the examination determined that he was a Negro mixed blood. Even though Ahmed was excluded by society and discriminated against, he was never deported or killed by the Nazis. When Mauthausen concentration camp was liberated, members of the US Army had the little black Austrian boys sit on their jeeps and they drove him around and used him as their mascot. As an adult, Ahmed struggled at first because the Nazis had denied him an education, but he made a living for himself and was proud to get a job as a crane operator. Even though you would not notice at first glance, Ahmed was a victim of the Nazi regime. Ahmed loved exploring faraway places in his caravan. He passed away in Mauthausen in 2011. In the institution, there's, of course, discussions. What can be put into a short video? For TikTok, this is a very long video. This is over a minute and a half. For other people working at the memorial, they say, this, you can't tell a biography in such a short time. So many discussions are had on what topics can we cover, what do we want to cover. One aspect that I took out of this um, video is that Ahmed was sterilized by the Nazis. He wanted to have a family after the war, but he couldn't. And he only later on found out um, what was done in the medical ex examinations as he was a young boy. So these are topics that maybe could go on the platform, maybe not, where we have a lot of discussions within our team internally. Um, one last example that I'd like to show you is how we also involve um, um, teenagers in our TikTok account is that we, last autumn we did a workshop with students who worked at the memorial for a while and cleaned objects and learned how to navigate the archives. And one of the things that they then after their work did was to do some peer-to-peer -peer, um, education and they did that in form of making TikTok videos. And this is one of the videos that a group of students from a local gymnasium did that we then uploaded to our channel. Can you tell us something about the acceptance of the TikTok channel, Mike? Yes. Um, I'll show you that and then I'll do that. 
Can you guess what this was? It was a toilet. While these toilets were modern and of decent quality, there weren't enough bathrooms for the concentration camp prisoners and hygiene was always an issue in the camp. So this is a very short video, about 15,000 people watched that. Um, and most of them are from Austria. We can see that in the analytics, I know the, the project you had had different numbers, um, but it always also depends on the region that you reach and um, the people that you get to. Um, in total, our account currently on TikTok, that doesn't really matter, but still it has 11,000 followers, um, which is a decent number. And um, some of our videos reach up to 800,000 views. Um, comparatively speaking, our memorial gets 200,000 visitors a year. Um, I know that in 20 seconds, we can't do a whole lot of education, but it's getting people in. It's forming a connection and being in touch with people who otherwise might visit the memorial once in their lifetime. And this is a second opportunity for them to form a relationship and have a chance to ask questions or just say, I will stare or I find this really sad or whatever they put in the comments. And TikTok is the platform where we have the most interaction in terms of um, comments and people also writing longer comments there, um, which deem is deemed as a success. We started this as a pilot project and now we've been doing it for almost two years and it's still going. Fine, thank you. Alina, you are in the midst of a war. You are an Ukrainian uh, filmmaker and we're happy to have you here first. And um, yeah, let me ask you something which you told me in the preparation we made before. You said that you are going to discuss to deconstruct monuments right now. Does it mean to deconstruct history as well? Yeah, uh, thank you, first of all, for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. And yes, I would like to tell about also about monuments. And first of all, um, I wanted to tell about uh, the documentary process that's going on right now in Ukraine, because I'm a documentary filmmaker. And it's really interesting. Um, uh, it's very common uh, sentence that uh, Ukrainian war, Russian-Ukrainian war, the most documented war in the history. And I'm really curious. So we have right now so many filmmakers and Ukrainian filmmakers who is uh, making films right now, documentary, and they document in very, very high quality uh, using like... Uh, the best cameras and the best sound. And I was thinking if we had such uh, archives from the first and second world wars, how would our like resources and perspective change? And it's really interesting how it will influence uh, the perspective in the future on these events. And Concerning the monuments, and I thought it could be very interesting because, first of all, for me, it was very interesting. Uh, when the war started, I recognized that all these events, they in some way um, contribute and not to only to their like modern history, to the future. It also changed in some way. Uh, these events, they change our perspective uh, of the history and um, I understand that we, as a society we start to dig into, into the past and to realize that we have a lot of unsolved problems and uh, we didn't speak about this too much, I mean concerning their like a Soviet history and Yes, and I was in Izum. It uh, like uh, it was liberated territory by Ukrainian armed forces after Russian occupation, and I found a monument. Uh, this monument was to their soldiers of uh, uh, Second World War, and it was bombed because of the hostilities. And right now, I would like to show you this monument. Show, short expert. No, no, this. The second video, how I could manipulate. Next? No, no, no. Yeah, this one.
so yes, um, for, for me it's quite interesting how um, the story not even like repeats itself, but this is a monument to the soldiers who died during the Second World War. And right now their bodies, they're like injured by new like bombs uh, from new war. And it like, um, like it, the, the new question uh, appears in our society, which actually, uh, what uh, part of the Soviet story is actually like our, our like Ukrainians? Because um, we remember these uh, repressions, we remember uh, like attitude uh, to like a second class, but like treating like a second class person because you are from Ukraine or you are from another post-Soviet uh, countries, not from Russia. So everything appeared and in the society also because of the media uh, started the process uh, concerning the monuments and it started during the war. It seems that it's not the right like time to do this, but on the other hand, it's the most right time to do this. and. Um, uh, we started the we start to dismantle the monuments um, uh, from Soviet Union, but not all of them. Of course, uh, we don't want to destroy the monuments to the soldiers, but we would like to dismantle like um, symbols and emblems of Soviet Union, like uh, for example, hammer and sickle and so on. And the second video that I would like to show you, this is actually this process uh, of dismantling. And uh, this is very huge monument in the center um, in, the, in Kyiv. And uh, yes, where is this? Next. Yeah. <laughs> You could see how many drones actually record in this process. Yeah, so they changed this Soviet emblem to the trident and uh, 
and I think that uh, thanks, it, it happened so quickly, thanks also to the social media, because all these uh, discussions concerning uh, should we do this or not, uh, they were held in social media also. So, yeah, that's um, how the information appeared very quickly right now. Is there, is there a different um, um, way of remembrance now on social media in the Ukrainian? Is, is this part of the, of the social media process in Ukrainian right now? That you have like a... Like a like, um, like getting this conflict into a production, into, 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 into a positive um, kind of remembrance? Mm, do you mean uh, such like uh, events uh, or like with this monument or in general? In general. In general, of course. Like, mm, uh, you know, like it's very connected to social media and uh, we received a lot of uh, personal stories uh, from this war through social media a lot of uh, heroic stories that became you know like a uh, ground of this war i could say you know some events some uh, actions of the people of soldiers and you know like um, and we have uh, a lot of photographers and cameramen right now on the front line who is, uh, you know, connected to their each brigade, you know, and uh, they are trying to be, to, to make this war more visible and these people who are fighting right now more visible and more um, to record them to, and, uh, and of course, you know, it's very important to have like evidences not only uh, about like a fight, but also evidences of the crimes. This is another side of uh, these such uh, things, for example, like uh, Bucha or exhumation in the Zoom where around 400 people died. Mm, and it was very exposed and filmed by press, international press. And it was super important to make actions in this war and to transfer in really, really quick way what's going on, actually. Thank you. <clears throat> Pavel, now we make a big step to history because you're a journalist and you're working at Auschwitz Memorial and you're responsible for the social media presence of the memorial. And you found some new ways to get the people connected somehow to the to this very deep physical place, which it is still, of course. But um, can you tell us something about your engagement? So I'll briefly try to show uh, a little expert, uh, excerpt about the work that we're doing. We were <clears throat> the first memorial in social media starting in 2009. And while um, I remember that in the past there were discussions whether the, even the Auschwitz Memorial should be in, should have a website, um, then there was this discussion whether social media is a place for such institutions. And we, in a way, stepped forward and we start, we set up a Facebook account in 2009 and it opened this door to many other institutions. But I'd like to start with a story to, to tell you how this uh, can build memory. And I think that when we talk about the social media, the social component is extremely important. And I need to turn because seeing this face so big for the first time in my life is uh, very interesting. So this is a, a photograph with a little biogram that we published on Twitter several years ago. It's Yeezy Popper, a Czech Jewish boy. And we, we published this as the next photo. And uh, basically, it's a very similar picture to um, many photographs that we can find of the victims of the Holocaust. But uh, when we posted it online, and I suppose if you're not a big um, Spanish football fan, you'll not, you, you will not notice anything uh, interesting there. But people who saw this photograph, and among our followers there are Spanish football fans, they noticed this, the pin that the boy has in a jacket. This is a sign of Real Sociedad, a Spanish club from San Sebastian. And very quickly people started asking questions, why this 
Czech Jewish boy, photographed in 1930s, has this pin in his jacket. And I didn't even notice the pin, so why would I know why is that? But people started digging, football fans started digging, Real Sociedad started searching, journalists started searching. And then it turned out that in Prague, there was a German football club, German Jews football club in, in Prague. And they were playing football. And then in early 1930s, they went to San Sebastian. They're, they had like a European tour and they played Real Sociedad and they won one game, they lost one game. And then Real Sociedad came for a rematch and then... Uh, unfortunately, this club lost 11-1 in this rematch. And the, the father of the boy was somehow linked with the club. We do not really know the connection, but this is when the pin uh, was given to the family. And this is the screen of, a, of Marca. Marca is the biggest Spanish sports magazine. And if you ask me years before whether a, the biggest Spanish sports magazine will publish a, a large column on the story of E.G. Popper, a Czech Jewish boy murdered in Auschwitz, you know, I would just, I, th this is impossible. But thanks to all this, thanks to the fact that we posted it in social media, that people responded, and there was a lot of uh, 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 that was spoken yesterday about people getting engaged, people getting moved by the story. This showed that people can together work out on a little biogram like this and then a sports magazine. And actually, there is a journalist from Marca who was triggered by this story um, because it happened a few years ago, and he wrote a book about sports in Auschwitz. So one tweet, one post, which seemed not to have so much significance started a domino that built a part of the memory. So this is just one phase that we published, and but actually what we do, and I may ask this question to the other, how many of you follow the Auschwitz Memorial on Twitter? Okay, I see two, three, I mean, uh, okay, so there is a lot of homework to do for some of you, but th these are, we publish right now, every two hours, uh, a similar uh, tweet with a face, with a little story. These are the faces that will be, or have already been published today. Um, so you will always get uh, just a, you know, little, little historical fact. And these are uh, basically uh, posts that are, uh, uh, that are uh, published on their birthdays. So there's always a birthday and then there's a little biographical information and sometimes we do not have a picture like with these Soviet soldiers because Soviet soldiers were not photographed. But this is memory that is dripping. Drop by drop, every two hours people will see the story. And then here are some of the numbers. You can look at the bottom of the picture. You can see the numbers of impressions in some of these cases. These are, uh, it seems that there are around 300,000 impressions in case of each of these photographs. It's every two hours. So it is something that reaches people. And something that is very interesting also that was discussed yesterday and today because you can say that this is only a factual information. This is a historical source, this is a photograph, a name, a date of birth, date of death. So there, there's pure facts. But we can also, when we look at some of these pictures, we can also see the emotional content that is not direct. But when people look at the picture of a baby murdered in Auschwitz, there is emotion is behind this factual information. And something that is very interesting to me, because we post those pictures repeatedly every year and we add more faces, that's the continuity of the project, is that we see that because the world is changing, the reactions of people are changing. The memory is different. The context of memory is different. Uh, a few years ago, uh, there would be some comments uh, talk, talking about, I don't know, maybe a situation in the United States and Trump. Two years ago, the context of Ukraine and war that Russia started started coming uh, under these posts. Right now, of course, the situation in Israel and many other things. So the, the memory that is important to those, I mean, things that are important to the people who follow us is reflected in their own memory when they uh, see those images. And here you can see the, the basic number of impression in one month in our social media. You can see Twitter is the most important, but it is also Facebook and Instagram. We are not on TikTok. Uh, but you had 87 million impressions in a month. And then when you think that before the pandemic, 2.3 million people visited the memorial in a year, these are numbers that are, um, that are giving you some perspective. And that's one thing I wanted to mention. And there's one more thing I'd like to talk about because here you can see the very unusual picture of uh, the site of Birkenau because photographing Birkenau empty during daytime is basically impossible. 
because it is open from 7.30 in the morning and we're closed as a memorial three days a year. But during the pandemics, we were closed for over 300, almost 300 days in uh, over two years. And this for us was something incredibly important because we, we uh, the people who work at the memorial, could see the site empty. And it's our mission that the survivors created the memorial in 1947. We as the kind of continue who people who continue the story as curators of this site, we are kind of used that this place is open to public and this is core of our mission to show people around, to tour people, to explain them the story. The authenticity of the site is the foundation of most of the things we do. And then the site was closed and people couldn't come and they couldn't come for many, many uh, weeks or months. And this was a trigger of a new project that we are going to start very soon. I cannot tell uh, you when because there are still some last obstacles including uh, the fact that one of the main technical developers in the Israeli company is now fighting uh, and he was drafted to the army but after uh, during the lockdown the um, an Israeli company that is an expert in um, software reached us and we started thinking what we can do together and we came up with the idea that because the site is inaccessible we should try to do something to make it accessible online, but not through um, something which is indirect, taking a few pictures and post them online or taking some kind of a panoramic images. But we decided to build a platform for live online tours, which means there will be a person live at the site, connected with anyone. It could be, for example, a room like this and the tour will be viewed in this huge screen and the, the guide will be live and will be talking and showing the site and there's a possibility of interaction. So we are like 95% done. There are a few last tests, technical things, a lot a huge technical challenge because when you think of the site of Birkenau, having the stable online connection was a challenge. And actually uh, Orange um, decided to, uh, they contributed to the project and they put the tower uh, very close to the site to give internet connection to the entire space so that our guides would never lose a connection when they are doing this educational project. So this will look like this. These are trials. So we have two guides with the devices. And this I, I've already done tours uh, like this and this is a very interesting experience. It's a different educational program completely um, uh, in, in, a, in a way this is a new revolution for us as educators. But something that is at the core of the, the faces that you saw and I can just move back to uh, to those to those faces but also the fact that people come to the site is the authenticity I mean it, it, it seems to be a Twitter educational program but the authentic part here is a name and a face and people are drawn to this and people are engaged because of this and the same is with the site when people visit they come to the authentic site and but while we can be extremely Glad that before the pandemics, 2.3 million visitors followed us, uh, uh, visited the memorial online. We can be, we, we need to remember that the fact that 2.3 million people visit means that around 8 billion people do not visit the site. And then through projects like this, through being in social media, we can try to reach people with the facts, with shaping memory, and uh, use their engagement and their, um, you know, all the context around us to, to kind of be this. Um, trigger um, element of of shaping uh, of shaping memory. So uh, this is uh, this is something that I wanted to because because this slide wasn't removed as I asked. I, <clears throat> I will. I'll just, uh, this is something that we're also doing at the memorial. Uh, we have an online magazine that talks about memory uh, in different places in the world. So just a, a short, in Memoria Auschwitz Org, you can simply uh, read it in English, in Polish online, and you can subscribe. You can also add if there are any projects uh, in the other sites, in the other spaces. So I'm using the opportunity that this slide just wasn't removed. It wasn't supposed to be the part of this presentation. So that's it, thank you. Thank you, that's very impressive, isn't it? Um, anyway, I have one more question right now. This kind of digital guide for the sightseeing of, is it just like a physical guide you can follow and ask questions or do you also think to make like an artific artificial intelligence kind of street view, going there, asking questions, having the answers prepared, so you know what no, I mean? No, so our, uh, the, the core of our guiding system is that it is based on a human, okay. which means there is there will be always a person life which 
creates many risks because the weather may be bad. The I don't know. You can fall. You can guide and you can trip. They, they, they may be th because it it will also be happening in the open museum. So there will be visitors around. Things are so the, the the person the guide must have many roles. First of all, you need to guide. You need to talk, but you need to be careful where you are. You need to be a cameraman to show the site. You need to be responsive because there may be questions coming during the tour. So this is a new set of. Um, uh, uh, you know, learning <laughs> that we need to do, but it's. I think it's worth it. But the, of course, it will not be the same as the uh, a, t a tour at the site. And we we understand the limitations. The time is different. Um, the possibilities of being in different places. We we do not have buildings included. But for example, we videoed some of the authentic site uh, spaces inside that usually people do not enter. And then we play this video during the tour, and the guide can give narration. We added testimonies of. Survivors. So there are video testimonies that are a part of the tour, and the guide can simply start the video and use it in several ways. There are drone footage, for example. So we we kind of use the uh, the thing that the online presentation give us, but we still uh, enroot it in the live narration of the guide, but also the, the the fact that the person is broadcasting live from the site with the possibility of interactions. There are, there are many. We use well, it's a combination. Of it's a combination. We, we, we simply use the uh, advantages that these form give us, understanding also many limitations that the, the tour at the site will not have. And we can have it online. And also mm -hmm. there are things in the regular tour at the site that will be completely different from these online tours. I think it's also interesting because it gives us an idea that COVID didn't damage, of course, lots of lives, but it always gave us a chance to make new approaches on social networks, how it works. So when you give us the image of the camp, it was very impressive just seeing the camp like it is when there's no one around, right? And so we can use these tools and make like 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 an acceleration of social network, in my opinion, that uh, we were not able to communicate physically for some time. So this is, if, for me, also part of maybe the only positive result of the, of the pandemic time we had we had to go through anyway now we have to start the discussion and that means that we have different roles and uh, Jeran, for me i would like to have you to be the opponent of the digital approach that means that you you said a sentence and i know that it's not like this of course but because you also try to 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 um, to um, to take some of these um, digital tools into your work, we could just could follow you at the at the digital map. But anyway, you said a sentence which I found very interesting, and it was like um, you said that um, embrace the digital, but don't throw away the analog. What do you mean by that? Um, well, that was. Uh Part of a discussion, uh, as I said, I was on some other projects, e remembrance projects, and it was look, comparing textbooks: um, Slovenia, Croatia, uh, Italy, Bosnia Herzegovina, and Serbia. Uh, and, and I was in charge of like the scientific committee, and we'd had uh, all these older scholars discussing, debating, and there were some younger students uh, who were uh, on the field trips with us. And we also went to Srebrenica and Yasanovac and so on. So we were taking them around. And then it was only towards the very end when we decided, well, let's ask actually these teenagers how they're studying. You know, And they said, oh, we, re re we really like um, YouTube videos that do a, a history show or we follow certain... Um, history programs that make history entertaining. So we're actually like listening to these, to these young people, and then uh, the colleague from uh, Sarajevo was saying, but the danger of, you know, as scholar, or scholars and as teachers, we, have to, we do have to adapt to the new technologies. But the danger was then, as this colleague from uh, Sarajevo said, yeah, but then if we just do YouTube videos and we just, you know... Um, forget some of the old processes. Uh, are we just going to throw away books and they never read? And okay, we, we heard earlier today also the shorter attention spans and let's adapt to that. Let's use these digital tools. But the danger is uh, if we capitulate as educators and say, okay, we're just giving up. We're never reading a book again. And, and you can see, uh, or I can see with my students, 
because of the way that um, we have access to so many, so much information, you're skipping from one video to another, and you've got little bits of information here and there. But remember those days when you had to like sit down with like a really big book and you spent hours reading it, and then you, that allows you to reflect more. So that was kind of uh, drawn from that experience. So we shouldn't completely uh, forget the old way of, of doing things. You yeah. know what I'm... I can understand, but for me it's a bit similar like um, when there were silent movies, people started to speak in the movies. Formula is the best silent movie, so when I was a young boy, my parents told me, just watch one half, half an hour television on Friday, that's enough, otherwise your brain will be damaged. I would be very happy if my son would uh, go back to television somehow, because now he's just playing with his uh, personal computer. And I think for me, it's the, 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 the key question is, if we can still take this kind of usual, well-researched literature books into this kind of social process, process with the networks which we just have, right? Well, that is... Yeah, maybe we just need to figure out how to use the tools we have for the purposes. We, maybe we haven't found that connection yet because these are new technologies. I mean, books have been around, whatever, thousands of years, and then that was how we learned history, through books and reading and reading. And then at one point, uh, we had we made readers. So the professor would choose five chapters or five articles, photocopy, and then give the students to that. That was when I was a grad student. And then we started scanning them. Now we have PDFs, and now we put these articles on Medlin or some kind of Moodle platform. And then, again, we're curating. So maybe it's our duty as uh, educators to help students now navigate these new technologies. But do you feel that there's like, like, a, like a, a lack of education with the new students at, at our times compared to former times? You've got the experience because you're a PhD, so you can just tell us some something about that. Are they more stupid than they used to be? No, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say that. I mean, that's the that's the easy uh, answer. That's to blame. You know, and every generation probably blames. Oh, the young kids don't even understand this because we used to do it like we used to read 50 books, and now they're only reading 10 books, and now they're not reading a single book. So I don't think they're stupid, but it is adapting to the ways we're taking in information, and I mean, I think there's maybe a benefit to have a much broader view of it, but I think it's also attention spans. And it was interesting when we were commenting about, oh, the, the kids these days are just constantly on their phones. And it was all the old people in the conversation were like typing away on their phones. So it's not like, a, you know, we're all te texting and checking our emails all the time uh, as well. But I think uh, I have noticed in terms of, um, you know, writing an essay or something, just because students aren't reading books, They're not, they don't know what a footnote is. They don't know how to con construct essays or arguments. I'm, maybe this, an essay format is an outdated mode of conveying information too. But for now, I mean, to get promoted, you have to publish articles in journals that are peer-reviewed that have citations. So there is a, still a format. You know, two plus two equals four. You don't do two comma two something else. You know, there's still a way of doing things. And because... When you read a book, you like, I assume, also look at the table of contents and then you look at the footnotes. And I mean, there's just a certain way you engage with a physical printed book. Pavel, Pavel you said that there's um, kind of an anchor system when you're going to make this. You, you use this word, anchor. That means that you put an anchor and from that it's, it's, it spreads somehow. And that's what happened, what you told us. Is there, do you have like, like an experience? Because also at your podcast, you told me that uh, historians work with that, that there's, um, th that this could be the first approach in order to get deeper into the, into the subject. I, I think this is linked uh, with, with what you were saying. Of course, um, we have so many different tools available to talk about, for example, the history of Auschwitz. And it doesn't mean that if we choose to use new tools, we should abandon the old ones. We simply create a bigger spectrum of things. So it's like with, a, with some of the good exhibitions. You enter into a huge exhibition and of course some people will only read the, the big captions and then move to, you know, from one room to another because they have 45 minutes to, to go through a museum. And there will be some people who will have whole day and they'll move from these big captions to smaller captions just open all the drawers, watch all the videos, and then uh, go out and they'll buy two books because they're interested more. And I think that we 
as institutions that deal with those complex stories, we need to keep this spectrum. Because on, on one hand, we need, we, we need to publish big historical books, and we do that as the Auschwitz Memorial. And actually right now we are almost um, finalized the publishing of the new chronology of Auschwitz, five-volume book that probably only experts will go to, will read, or people who want to be guides, because this is really expert knowledge. But it, it must be on the shelf, it must be available, because then I can take it and then find one date and accord, you know, use this one date on a, on a Facebook post or Twitter, and then I, I will have this um, possibilities. So, and and we what we are trying to do because social media, the engagement is there, but uh, the attention span is one thing. The, the the way that people use it, so how quickly they will move from our post, which is in the context of all other posts uh, in their feeds. But what we try to do there, we, we try to cre create materials that will be that must that can be connected. And so, for example, when people see a picture of Yeezy Popper, I can send another tweet or I can use it on Facebook or on Mastodon or anywhere else because we have an online exhibition on the Theresienstadt uh, family camp in Birkenau. So if someone, okay, uh, I, I'm kind of moved by the story of this little boy, what was Theresienstadt? What was the fate of Jews deported from the Residenstadt to Auschwitz? Aha, uh -huh. the, the memorial created an exhibition and they will click and then again, they can go through those slides in the exhibition for a moment or they can read more. This, this is why we have also podcasts, yeah. we have books and uh, online lessons that people so. can find. So we, we try to create kind of a, um, you, can, you can say this, 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 um, this spectrum of knowledge, let's call it like this. Yes, I and think... It can mm, be from this little mm, drop to mm, this universe. This is... The question is distribution somehow, how you can make a big distribution from, from, from this anchor point. And I read about um, the ideas at Haifa University where they have also this Holocaust studies where they plan what to do with the Shoah Foundation material, which, which is quite similar, that the, the, contemporary, the contemporary witnesses who are going to pass away right now, or still there are some, but not least there are less and less, how can we take this test testimony, testimony for the future somehow. And they plan also to make distribution on these, um, on these witnesses telling into a camera what happened to them in order to get new, a, a future kind of, 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 of remembrance, which is, for me, it has, it has to be like this, otherwise we lose this, this, this vital contact. Alina, you wanted to tell us something about um, this problem, I think, that, if you can say that, that beyond war and the conflict and people dying in a war, you have this new Ukrainian question right now. In order, how can we do some remembrance on that? Are you planning to, to, to integrate this in your work also? Where's this, uh, this identity? beyond cheap nationalism in order just to say this is where we where is our self-identity after the war thank you for this question uh, yes of course like um, this will be part of the film and, uh, and of course like uh, we would like to uh, we would like to show this process how actually society became mobilized in this situation. First of all, it was house. Then society decided that they would like to fight and so on, so on. But um, I was thinking when I was listening to you and I was thinking about, you know, about other sides of uh, social media and how it works with the memory, how it works um, uh, with society, because it could be, you know, like the propaganda exists. And sometimes with social media, with vid uh, videos, uh, when you try to reach uh, people's memory, it's so easy to manipulate with media. And we see that, uh, unfortunately, in Russia, people uh, became, became crazy because of this. And they, because of this propaganda, was strictly connected to the past. This society, in some way, stuck in the past and live in this past, by past, not, not by few, with future. And uh, they don't understand there are like, different countries already, not Soviet Union anymore. Please come down. So... When I was thinking, I was thinking that, yeah, that like 
propaganda is not always something bad. We all, also have in Ukraine propaganda to make, for example, more positive mood, um, uh, to, to like uh, transfer more, more positive mood to the people, just, you know, to encourage them, not the, because it's a very depressive situation. It's not every time, but, but it could be used in really, really for bad issues. And yeah, it's a really powerful uh, weapon. Yes, it is. That's for sure. Um, Marlene, I forgot you somehow. <laughs> um, tell us something about um, the part of the whole in Mauthausen you are with your TikTok channel. The part of the whole, I mean, in, in terms of, um, of historians working there, of the traditional kind of, um, of, of working on, 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 on remembrance. Mm, we have a whole team doing the TikTok account, which is really important because um, having the historians there, I'm a historian too, but training, but I'm now in the educational department, but having someone else look at um, our scripts and what we want to put out um, and intervene and say, maybe this is, it needs a correction, um, use a different word. Um, those are really important interventions. Um, also, when, when it comes to on the first panel today, um, there was talk about emotions. As you might have noticed on the videos, there is music. And this has been a discussion in museum settings and also in memorial sites of emotionalization. And music can really do that. And it's quite interesting to see what, also in the film world, what, when you use different music or background noise, how the atmosphere changes. Um, and um, this is something where we need to be quite careful um, of what to um, use there to not manipulate. And you're completely right, also a platform like TikTok has a huge potential for radicalization. Um, we're using it to put um, correct information out there and to we can never counterbalance the misinformation spread on social media with such a small a museum that we are. Um, but what we are mostly focused on is having a positive propaganda to make people Democrats and anti-fascists, um, but um, to also strengthen a community that is already interested in those things. Um, we as a memorial cannot counterbalance um, whole um, troll systems coming after videos. That's not something that we have the power or even in any way the means to um, to counterbalance that, but strengthen a community that is already interested in those subjects um, and has shared values. And then to, to tell them, hey, there's other people doing this as well. Um, and for them to find some form of also comfort, but also more education there. Um, that yeah. really swayed from your question, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, we are speaking on, um, on propaganda, fake news, informative, and, and, and about the danger. But of course, my question would be right now to you, Pavel, and also to you, Marlene, is there kind of a community management in order to control these kind of uh, commentaries which are, for example, denying the, the Holocaust? Do you yes. have like a control system yes. for that? Um Thankfully, TikTok has stepped up there and has made an automatic filter system where you could put in thousands of symbols um, that change constantly, that people um, comment on the videos or maybe message you, um, and then the system filters them out. Um, it's automated um, because sometimes we don't have the resources to view all of those comments, and it's not very good for our mental health either. Um, but um, there is a management system there because we have to um, manage those social media accounts because um, sometimes there's a lot of comments or interactions and sometimes not. Um, for me, as a creator on the platform, it's quite useful to do this um, for an institution because there's a whole team there. There are many stories of creators who are very active and uh, activists um, using social media who get burnout, activism burnout, or just completely overwhelmed by um, hate, hate speech on the platforms um, and are not supported by the platforms at all. Um, but for me, that's quite a, there's quite a lot of safety there as well. We are a small team though, um, 
but it's also good to have reassurance that all of the information, just as you said, now you can look in a book or you have someone else look over and you can know that this is correct, what you're putting out there. And I think that, that our two institutions also differ because it's me as a person um, being vulnerable on the platform, whereas you're showing pictures, but you then also have the issue of keeping those people safe in the past. Do you get hate speech in... in so, so, so first of all, it's always important for me when this question arises to give the context of numbers because um, when I need to read, I, I read all the comments in Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, which is five, seven thousand a day. And uh, most will be emojis, but very few of those are problematic, are something that we're flagged. So we are using um, a, a special platform that helps the management and helps going through this rather quickly. But of course, as we protect the authentic site and we will not allow any form of you know, hatred, but also bad behavior. Um, and again, we need to remember that among those 2.3 million visitors who visited us in 2019, very few misbehave. That's kind of, again, we need to remember about the um, uh, about this balance, that negative things is r r rather incidental around this mass of engagement. But of course, because we are uh, as an institution, we are supposed to protect the dignity of the victims, to protect the facts and memory. We have to be active. So on one hand, we are interactive in social media. So we talk to people, we leave comments. We also try to uh, look at what is going on there. And so we are engaged as a, uh, as the accounts. And so we sometimes step into some discussion. On the other hand, we need to be careful and different platforms allow us different things on Facebook, on uh, Instagram. We can remove comments that are, I don't know, uh, Holocaust denial is rare, but it happens, or instrumentalization, or simply um, scamming for data, because you, you will also find it in social media, or just spreading some links that you do not want to get there. Um, so we need to remember, one thing is to create the content, but there is a responsibility that we have to, to kind of look you cannot just put it into the world and then, okay, so... Do you have a community management or not? So, so um, Actually someone who's taking care for this kind so of... So this is what I'm doing. I'm On one hand, I'm responsible for uh, creating the content. On the other hand, I'm also responsible for... Okay. Okay, so, so, so we have this. But what is also very interesting is that people... Uh, are around us, the, our followers. And sometimes they will find things that, for example, they think we should get engaged or we should react. Now with this new software, it's much easier to follow comments chronologically. So even if someone will comment on a post that was, uh, that was published five months ago, I'll have it in the queue. But in the past, I didn't have that. And people were you know, letting us know, listen, you have this, this post and someone posted something problematic, maybe you should do something. So what is encouraging, and this is why I emphasize the social part of the social media, that we build it in a community, that it creates community that can get engaged. And I just remember a few weeks ago, we posted uh, on Facebook, on Twitter, we were missing a women voice for our podcast, an English native speaker to, the, to do the voiceovers. And we couldn't find a person, so we decided, oh, let, let's right on social media and we thought you know maybe we'll have three five people that will decide to do something we had so many that it was we, we I, I felt a little bit awkward having to write them that um, we had so many that we will not even be able to listen to the samples because we already find a person but this engagement of people is something that is really really important that for the people who can who do not come to the memorial who, who we do not meet in person in the authentic side. This history is important to so many people around the world, and this memory is important to so many people around the world. Yes, I think it's a very nice point because you said that um, it doesn't work without we, to give a voice to history. We need this kind of social network working right now. Anyway, um, um, I feel it's also important to stay in control of the whole process somehow. And I think democracy also means that it's strong and that we need fundraising for that. We need also governmental work in order to, to, to encourage the people to make something very vital and don't give it to the to the to the to the to Donald Trump, for example, at the end the, the social network. So I would like to open it now to you. If you have any questions, please join us uh, for a little 
discussion or whatever. Is there any question? You're overwhelmed by the by our session or ah here's someone. Um, I have one question, Frau Alina Gorlova. This is Frau Koma from Ukraine, it may be interesting. Uh, Kiev all right uh, now or no? Uh, I live in Kiev, I come in Germany one year, if I months old. You can ask in Ukrainian, perhaps it's because it's better to understand. I Uh, this is a question about the situation in Kiev right now. So, um, uh, I really, I'm okay to live in Ukraine right now. It was my decision to stay because I feel that that's what I should do to work there. And uh, I feel a lot of freedom and I feel a lot of, you know, life energy. In When in these dark times, you know, it's common thing that some light moments and it became more brighter and uh, for me I really love to see how society change is, is changing you know and how people are trying to fight against corruption and to see all these uh, soldiers and fighters and of course volunteer there are a lot of positive energy of course it's some like sometimes dangerous but when you live in Kiev or you live somewhere in the middle of Ukraine or even on the best in the, in the west of Ukraine uh, it's okay and in some way you um, for for you these like uh, uh, bombs and uh, all, uh, aerial alerts yeah uh, like it's uh, became something uh, common like common thing in your everyday life yeah so in conclusion, yeah, I see, I really see a lot of energy right now there, and it's a really interesting process. Alina, Alina, um, I would like to add a question. So you said that you deconstruct monuments. If I had the power to, like a symbol, to, to construct a new monument right now after the war, what could it be this, what could it look like, this kind of monument? Um, yes, of course. Uh, let me think what we. I could, I could uh, say what one example. For example, uh, we do, we right now with the construction like big monuments. They are usually, as I said, not to the warriors from Second World to Yeah, there is from something uh, that connected to, to Soviet propaganda, or it's, for example, of course, Lenin and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, some officials, yeah, uh, we deconstructed them right now. But at the same time, we have uh, an example: a young volunteer. Uh, he was an actor and he died in the first weeks of, uh, of the war. Uh, he was shot by Russian military uh, while he was trying to help uh, with the evacuation of people. And people organized and uh, make a uh, not very big, small monument in his native city, Irpin. Maybe you know uh, this city. It was occupied in the first days uh, in Kiev region. And they created this little monument. But you know, in this little monument, in, in, you know, in, uh, to compare with these huge monuments from Soviet era, in this small monument, um, there was uh, much more some sense you know, and uh, very fresh memories of all these people who knew this boy. This reminds me a bit on Vera and also on, on this kind of morals in Croatia, which are kind of just come, coming from the people. Yeah, well, I mean, many of the things that we've been seeing going on in Ukraine, in especially in uh, 2014, and then was the wave of the Lenin monuments being removed, and now even more monuments, some being damaged by the war, but also then, as you said, deconstructed or removed. 
you know, in Croatia and the other former Yugoslav countries that happened in the 90s. And uh, then there are these um, counter memorials or counter memories. Uh, in Croatia, it was this Ustasha regime who were then suddenly being portrayed not as fascist collaborators, but as anti communist fighters or even victims of communism. So that. Of course, communism also had propaganda and negative uh, aspects, but there was a solidarity and a unity. And I think in Ukraine, there's also these Bandera monuments, who's also a controversial figure. So sometimes if it's bottom-up, it's not uh, also you know, positive. There has to be some kind of uh, public discussion about what kind of values you want in public space. And in Croatia, after many years of being criticized by it for this revisionism, for this fascist symbols in public space, they finally actually took down some of these problematic Ustasha monuments, and now you really can't put Ustasha symbols on monuments. But you can put them on murals, and that's what I'm studying. It's the shift, because murals are always in this gray zone. It's semi-legal. It's much easier to paint a mural than to build a monument. And so I think Croatia has cleaned up its public space in terms of problematic fascist symbols on official monuments, but it's still on our walls and it's still the young people are having this. But, um, you know, the, the, it, as, and even a bad monument or a problematic monument can foster some kind of discussion ab about these things. Even like a concentration camp, you could argue we should erase a concentration camp because it was like a bad thing, but no, we preserve it and then discuss it. So even sometimes problematic monuments can help us have a debate about it. Not to glorify okay. these things. Monuments often do that, but to engage in some kind of public discussion. There's one more question from the audience. Yeah, thank you very much to all of you. Um, I think we heard one sentence only about a project that we didn't hear more than one sentence of. And please don't think that I want to be impolite, but I want to hear something about Ich bin Sophie Scholz. How can we have a look at it? How can, can we get to know more about that project? And you, you can go to on Instagram, it's still there. So you can just have the review of the year when we... And we found, my colleague Susanna and me, we found it very interesting that, and this could be also add something to the discussion that, and I told you already also in, in, in our preparation call, that we have something like a diary, a, a daily life of Sophie Scholl in this year before she died in Munich. She was sentenced to death by Freisler. And this diary was partially included in letters, partially in, what she, in, in her thoughts. And she's, this was a, ki, a, a high point of reflection she did from that point of view. And this wouldn't exist today anymore. So we had this everyday life in combination on her thoughts and, and, in going and, and, and undergoing the process of resistance, being part of the resistance movement of her brother and the other students of the, of, of, uh, the Weiße Rose. And this kind of diary gave us the chance to make like an Instagram channel. Say this is the this is uh, f um, February um, the fifth. Maybe it's my birthday or whatever. And I'm going to I'm going. I, I don't think she was born in February the fifth, but uh, this is my first day at university. And today my f my brother picks me up from station, and and we're going to have a birthday. So that's how we started. So what happened is that we had like 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 hundreds of commentaries. We were overwhelmed by that, saying. Happy birthday, Sophie. And we were like surprised because our community management said, how can this be? We have to undergo this emotional interaction process to say, and we said, yeah, thank you, so nice. <laughs> and this is how we started to get this community. And after a few days, we had like 900,000 people following the channel just by a happy birthday. But this help didn't help for the for the press reviews, because these people from FAZ Süddeutsch say, how can you do this? Sophie Scholl to say, happy birthday. So, <laughs> of course, you, you may be sure that my research on this historical character is quite deep. So I read really lots of books. And also from the beginning, I made a radio. I interviewed um, her sister, Inge Scholl, in 1989. Uh, and I made a radio feature on her, and this was the real beginning also of a deeper reflection. I made this uh, cinema event, um, Let's the Target of Sophie Scholl, also editing this one with uh, Fred Breinersdorfer and Mark Rotemund. 
So we had this kind of last five days of Sophie Scholl, and now I found it very interesting to make this Instagram project. So, And this, this doesn't mean that I'm a stupid boy, okay? It doesn't just mean that I would like to get these people who normally are not in contact with a, with a, with a character like her, who perhaps, you know, why so rosa, what's that? Again, ah, I have a feeling somehow like that. And they undergo this process in, 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 in a yearly interaction with this kind of character we have. But of course, we had lot of, lots of critical claims also, but I think at the end it worked. May I add something? May I add something? Because I know that you've gotten a lot of criticism for your project as well. Um, but one of the interesting things you mentioned now is that some people just engaged and said happy birthday, which is a bit of a weird thing maybe, but also a personal connection. Um, and this is something that we see on the broader spectrum with um, remembrance culture, that oftentimes when we've talked in this, in this forum now about young people a lot and how young people are not interested or have short attention spans and should remember. Um, and then all of a sudden they do and they connect to history and we see that also with pictures taken at memorial sites, um, the discussion about selfies, um, and then they interact and they're criticized for it. Um, there was about three years ago, there was a, ha a challenge going around on TikTok called the Holocaust Challenge where people, um, it was mostly young girls um, talking about a fate of a Holocaust victim and just reading that story. Often it was uh, very simplified and sometimes they put makeup on and that was then heavily criticized and they got a lot of, of hate on the platform and were very confused and felt like they did something wrong because they did what was taught to them in school to use a person like Sophie Scholl or Anne Frank and connect to them yeah, and do memory. Certain. And I think that's a very difficult thing to navigate. And it's often um, minorities, people of color, LGBT kids, um, um, migrants who are then criticized for doing memory wrong on social media also, wishing someone happy birthday because there's a wrong and a right way of doing memory and learning from the past. Yeah, we felt a bit like, um, if I can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen, but we had to stay in the kitchen because it was like a real discussion which started. We had a like a show by Jan Böhmermann, who was a very popular political entertainer on TV, and he made like, look at Sophie Scholl, you can cook together with me. And so he would, so we got all this kind of like, 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 like. But at the end, I think... Um, I'm not so sure if um, from this people, who, young people, of course, and that was really interesting for me to see that we really came to these young people mostly, which I was not aware when I make like a, like a crime detective serial in German, in German television, I know that the average is like 60 years old, like my age. But these were really young people following us and, and it helped a lot for me to just get them into contact. And I think it's not so important if they are... Um, if they're going to follow Taylor Swift the next day, you know what I mean? So just for me, it's important that they get this kind of lively interaction with a historical character. And of course, we try to make on a second channel to give them some suggestions where they can follow in a deeper way of um, reading books, which are which are, uh, are widely published on, 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 on Weiser Rosa. And also we work together with the Weiser Rosa Foundation in Munich, where you were at university. I know Hildegard Kronewitter very well. And she, she, they were supporting us from the beginning because they know that people get a similar physical approach in Instagram like if they have been there. So that's because we have actors acting. and So, the, so I think at the end it was interesting, but uh, we're also trying to think on, on following projects, but it's not so easy. We had this kind of diaries this year, this kind of, and that was a, a chance just to make it like this. Okay, is there any, anything else? Any, yeah. Anyone else? Well, I think actually what you just said, you know, the difficulty of navigating these um, different platforms, because it is a spectrum and there's a lot of new tools out there. And I think <laughs> as educators, you know, we're probably also a few steps behind, but we need to learn how to navigate them, understand them, and then also help uh, the young people. And because of social media, which has this ability to you know, be, reach 900,000 people, but it also has the ability of someone criticizing you very quickly for it. I mean, a, a colleague in uh, Maastricht, uh, she was having some students do memes related to the Holocaust. So, I mean, also how much, um, you know, 
irony or humor are you allowed to do? Because I think a meme in its production often is, uh, you know, a little bit surrealist, a little bit funny. And then you give students and young people, you know, do a Holocaust meme. I mean, how, you know, that could go terribly wrong very quickly. Yeah, but I think, I think we really don't know, and now I'm more a participant than a moderator, sorry for that, but I think we really don't know how this kind of, of development will be with his social media account. I know about projects like prominent contemporary witnesses who are not there anymore to translate them into holograms in order just to to make like 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 a, to to have the chance to have a vital approach to this kind of historical character. So they will happen a lot, I think. For so we can't stop it right now, the wave, but we can perhaps control it. That my my opinion, and I, that's that's my personal opinion. At but, the end, do you have a vision of of, of remembrance for the future, perhaps as a last wave? <coughs> okay, thank you. Um, just one question. Um, you were discussing social media in general. Um, which are generally short-lived media. So we're thinking about um, what do you do about more sustainable online activities, um, like, like, like Wikipedia, for instance. I did a couple of articles because I was involved in the, in the foundation of the Austrian House of History, Haus der Geschichte Österreich, so I work in Vienna. And, um, and there are wiki wars sometimes going on. If you, if you edit certain articles, I was shortly involved in a very short one, fortunately, because there's a very debated history in Austria for homegrown fascism from 1934 to 1938. So, um, but Wikipedia is something that's long-lived, which is uh, more sustainable. So I was wondering um, what your activities are there, if you're investing there, if, you, if, 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 you, if you're doing more in this field, or if you have some so thoughts on how to sustain this and, and continue, because uh, as far as I can see, uh, Wikipedia is always in, in a critical situation financially. I'll just talk about the Auschwitz Memorial. <clears throat> I was, we were, because we were talking about this new, you know, education, internet, all other media, but of course we have, as I said, we try to create the entire spectrum. So on one thing you'll have the social media posts, but we have the entire website with historical information on Auschwitz. We have the, something that our e-learning is doing is that at, at the very beginning when we started this kind of conceptuals on e-learning, we thought we'll do online courses and we'll have closed groups and there'll be interaction. But we actually th started thinking that um, this is, um, on one hand, this is very positive, but it will reach uh, a very few people. And organizing an online seminar for 30 people is a huge uh, challenge, financially, technologically. So we decided that we will do a different strategy and we'll try to create as much online open resources available for people, but curated into online lessons. And right now on our website, lesson.auschwitz.org, you can find 37 lessons on different topics on the story of Auschwitz, very general but also very kind of very specific uh, that are uh, all of them are in English and they are very very broad uh, in terms of the material chosen because someone will open it and will click and okay they they, they will read just the, the big beginnings of every chapter but if you are a teacher and you're searching or someone interested and you're searching more you'll get to testimonies you'll get to different graphs all the we decided to put there in a way too much material because we could, we, we could make it very short. When we, we have podcasts, which again are going to stay and they're on many platforms, and our historians were, at, at, at the very beginning, were quite reluctant. Ah, we're going to talk about history, who's going to listen to it? Because they are used to have an audience in front of them. I mean, they listened to a room of 50 people and the lecture was there. But now when they see that our podcasts have hundreds of thousands of, really, uh, our podcast in English is probably going on all the platforms. We have 800,000 uh, opens. So I can tell them, your lecture was listened to 15,000 people. So they understand the perspective. And this is there. It's not going to disappear. It's not going to be a, a, a tweet that will very quickly... We published books. So as I said, we try to create a spectrum of that. And just to go back to the discussion that you had, I think we as the institution also have a responsibility to... To, to be engaged, to critically analyze different way of 
uh, people's reactions because we can on one hand we, we may not criticize uh, people who will say happy birthday on this but then you can have a discussion with the people do you did you re I mean have you realized that you are trying to talk to a historical character I mean to build upon these reactions uh, a spectrum like with the selfie uh, a selfie is just a, a picture but the motivation to take a selfie can be uh, problematic or can be very positive so to deconst uh, we should also have the responsibility to be part of it and to take a stand because it's not that every, you know people can get engaged in any form and we should just sit and listen and be observer we need to if we don't have an opinion i think we should build an opinion of how this new types of engagement can uh, reach can may maybe be problematic but also showing the spectrum is very important uh can I just comment about the, the wiki wars? Because in Croatia, there was like a big scandal of a number of uh, the authors tended to be very right-wing, and they were the ones uh, editing and adding to all of the posts and the entries, especially about the Second World War. And then that was like discovered, and then they were actually pushed away and then re-edited. But there was like a big problem because actually all my students were always going to Wikipedia. So I guess also to, again, follow up on this, you know, learning how to navigate, and you were saying... You know, being critical, it's, I think, critical thinking skills that can then be applied for the young people to also, and for us to navigate this huge amount of information that's out there. Because I don't think there's a lack of information. It's about how do we know which one is. Also, if, I would like also have a, a private example for sustainability because I've got a son who's 15 years old and I had the problem because the desk was just for gaming, like a personal computer who spread. I thought, well, why, how, can this, how, how can this person increase? There was not a, sp a single space left on this desk. And my wife told me, why don't we give my son Jim another desk just for reading books, open lectures? So we just made him a gift to give him this other desk. And there's no mobile phone, nothing on that. It's just we're working for school. And it does with a little amount, but much, even 10 times more than before. And you got one degree better in school by that. So I think it's really a symbol for me, like the combination of the two tools, which we just need, like the combination of tradition, but also being aware there's the time we live on, we can't stop. We have to use it somehow to, in to, to, to include in our lives. And for me, this is like a symbol <laughs> what you can do with the, with the social networks in order to integrate them in your life okay and uh, yeah. Last, um, yeah. you're raising a very important point um, for seven decades Mauthausen Memorial was part of the Ministry of Interior the ministry is not known to be digital natives <laughs> um, and so there's a lack of expertise in the area and a lack of awareness on war for example very well-written Wikipedia articles could offer and do offer. And there's also a lack of resources. Um, we are not an overfunded institution. Um, we don't have the personnel to do some of that. And there's also a lack of awareness in many cases because sometimes historians um, are stubborn um, and stick to books and um, not to other forms that are digital, um, but they're slow change. Um, and you also talked about social media being very short-lived and that's something we're well aware of. Um, and we will soon probably move to another platform. TikTok will not be um, around for 10 years maybe. Facebook and Instagram have seemed to stick around and Twitter, who knows. Um, so there will be new things and decisions will be made. Um, usually, I think, uh, as this memorial says, we have not really delved into the very, very short, um, short-lived ones like uh, Be Real or like Snapchat, because they're just too quick um, with 24-hour time spans, but something that is at least there for a while. Thank you. So we are at the end, right? Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. And um, have a nice day. <laughs>